Yeah, my view of the Middle East is a bit skewed towards how the Middle oh, East it's is. Amazing! It's like everyone's really clever. <laughs> it, it, I do agree that that there is there is a big difference in culture wise and how business is done. You know, he, he, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say nepotism in the Middle East, but there is a heavy hand of nepotism in a lot of firms. Um, but I think more importantly, the the aspect of connections, of value of of trust. But I think that's better than the West. You know, I mean, I, I agree. If, I'm not saying that negatively. If, if you find someone that delivers something for you and they deliver it on time, it's great quality. You'll ask them for anything, won't you? Because you trust that they're going to deliver. Whereas the West, when they constantly go out for new companies, trying to get cheaper deals and undercut, and yeah, there's. Yeah, you lose that. I mean, I do a similar sure. thing to you, right? So one of my big channels that I do for business is I run a free academy. Mm -hmm. right? And it's uh, completely open. It's hypergrowth.academy. I you saw it. Go on there, sign up. And my goal is to train a thousand people for free this year. Thank you, Dom. I'm up to over 300. Oh, wow. The system already. Now, out of those 300, a good proportion are now clients. So give me the sales pitch then. So you're, you're, you're promising 40% growth. 50, uh, no, 50, double, 100% growth. 100% right? so, growth. Yeah, no. If you're okay. a small company, mm -hmm. you're business to business and you're mm -hmm. a service type industry, right? So mm -hmm. you have a, a decent deal size, $5,000, $10,000 or more, right? Whatever you're selling. I'll work with you for six months. I'll do a whole series of workshops to implement a new uh, sales pitch, a new sales process look at how the way you do your lead generation, your wholesale strategy, and also do a whole chunk on attitude psychology of sales. Mm. So there's a whole series of workshops, re, you know, reconfigure your sales process, everything that you're looking at the market. And then every week I meet you and we meet, you know, it's accountability sessions basically, it's coaching, right? So every week I meet with my clients and you just see each week they go up, up, up. And then after six months, once you've implemented this and you've practiced it, that's it. You're away. You're flying. So, and it's, I mean, think of most small businesses. Most small businesses, particularly in Bahrain and Saudi, but most small businesses around the world, someone started that business because they're passionate about something, whatever it is, like your business, right? Clothes or whatever, whatever it is that you're sure. passionate about. So you're an owner of a small business. You make it grow. You work hard. You get everything in place. 99% of small businesses has done zero sales training. They don't know what they're doing at all, right? They're basically going into the market, let's try some podcasts, let's try some email, let's try some, you know, trying to get customers. And if you just apply a basic system, it's basically sales for non-sales people, right? That's what I did. This is right. exactly the reason. That was one of the key things I saw on your LinkedIn profile that clicked with me. And I was like, I want to know more about Miles. I want to know more about how he started this venture. And this is exactly that, 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 that little sheen I had and it clicked with me. And I, I find it brilliant because I think this, this concept of, of a sales strategy or sales academy is something that is common, but not that common, especially in Bahrain, right? I don't know anyone else doing it like, you can get, so if you go places like BIBF or training centers, they do very standard sales training, but it, it's, it's just not targeted at small businesses that have to do the whole sale. They don't teach you exactly how to do a sales process. It's all very theory. Whereas what I do is I'm going to work on. with you and so we're, we're going to double your business. If we don't double your business, then we're, you know, we're going to work twice as hard and make it happen. So like, <laughs> no refund on that. We're just going to work harder. Well, I, do, you know, if people, I like that. I like if that. If people negotiate, some people have negotiated refunds and cash back. So I do some businesses I'll guarantee if it's, sure. if it's a real good fit. So if it's an obvious service led industry, a decent sale size, I'll actually have a money back guarantee. Oh wow! Their business in oh six wow! Months, right, um, but of course it depends. They're, they're, right. So, for example, if I'm working with a company, and say they're a warehousing company, they're doing warehouse space, and they're already eighty percent full. Sure, sure, how can sure. You double their business. Right? Sure. You can only double their business if they buy another warehouse, right? And that's, that's or more high cool. value target, right? <laughs> that would be the other other. Percent. Yeah, raise your prices is sure. the fastest way to increase profits. If you can raise your prices, that's definitely a way to do it. Well, that, that's what people don't. Re this is some of the things that I find interesting in the business world because people don't seem to grasp that the only way to increase in profitability is to increase your margins. So you're either cutting costs or you're increasing price. That's the only way you're, you're doing that. But for whatever reason, people are like like have this weird thing on their back saying they need to sell more and more and more. 
Like, well, if, if, you know, if you're not working with your economics of scale, right, then you're going to get in trouble. But it's easy to sell more. That's the thing is, mm. like, every company I work with is using one or two or three sales channels, right? You should be using five or six, mm. right? So if you're doing cold calling or you know events like this to get people in some people that's all they do they just do two channels right you then start teaching them how to use linkedin um you know how to really use webinars effectively how to do cold email which is a god mine like when you're particularly out here in the middle east cold email is just it's ridiculous uh, isn't amazing. it amazing it works so well isn't like, it isn't it ridiculous <laughs> I totally agree with you. It's ridiculous. So countries that you can't... So you've, you've got to be careful of laws around the world. Like the UK, well, Europe has GDPR, and then you've got Canada has their own. You've got Australia's quite strict. Germany's quite strict as well. But most countries around the world, you do business-to-business -business email. It's perfectly legal and legitimate. Here's my business. I want to promote my service to you. But, yeah, it's, it's amazing. But if you can get all of these channels, and then what you do is you tie them together... So if you're gathering thousands of emails, use that email database not just for selling your services and products, but for selling your webinars as well, you know, podcasts, whatever it is like this. Especially and if you do a two-form attack, right? You're exactly, sending an email, you're making that phone exactly, call, right? Right. So then you're, and then you can use retargeting. So if you're emailing people and they're clicking on something, ring them up. Why don't people do that? It's so obvious. If someone's actually clicked on your website, they're interested. They've read a piece of material, they've clicked on your website, ring them up. <laughs> this, this is one of the things I've learned from, from a lot of people who work in sales, and, and one of the key things I always hear is that majority of customers just want to be closed, right? And, and they don't know, and, and your process as, as, as the agent, as, as the sales person, is to get them through that process. You have, just have to hold that client's hand to, to between, you know, they know already they want to close, otherwise they wouldn't have enacted with you. It depends. You, you need to qualify them, but you need to qualify them really early on, right? So people sure, often sure. do qualification too late in the sales process. So, you know, here's a proposal and they don't have money. Or here's a proposal and, oh, it's actually my boss that decides this, right? If you if you don't qualify early on, then you're you wasting your time. If you qualify early on, then 100%, you should be closing at least half of the deals. You know, 50% should go through. Most, of, uh, there's, especially for my tech sales, because we do mostly B2B, there's there there have a, we don't we don't accept an order under 75 units full stop it's it's just not worth our time not worth our money we don't we don't do b2c want to do b2c go find someone else it's not our business and and the amount of the, the i would say about 70 percent of our our questions that we get that wheeze all that out and then the other perspective is that we we get a lot of them from the last 15% or so, we get then asked about, uh, um, we get then asked about, uh, uh, about price lists and stuff like that, which also is very confusing because, you know, the mar your, whoever the purchaser is, they already know the market price, right? So I don't know why they even need to ask at that point because it's a, it's her, 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 homogenous, the price, right? The entire industry is about the same. It's one BD more, one BD less, but it's about everything the same. So we normally just send over a price list, and that's the end of that. So for our process, is is very easy when it comes to from the textiles business. But I hear from a lot of clients, not clients is not the right word, but I hear a lot of people on the show who come on who are entrepreneurs who own a coffee shop, own a, a, a gym membership, or own a app that is for dog walking. Right, they have they have zero sales experience, and neither are they looking to close customers. <laughs> Where you like, what are you doing? But yeah, why isn't there anyone in Bahrain doing this? Is when I first started mm. a year ago, I was puzzled. I was like, it's almost like historically, sales in the Middle East is so much who you know. Yes, no yes, one's yes. No one bothered learning sales, and all of a sudden, we're now post COVID. People are looking around for better prices. There is a lot more. Um, you know, Western type, let's see where we can get the best service from, let's try different things out. Um, so now you have to learn to sell, you have to, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's bizarre people don't have the skill. And then they often just, they, you know, they'll employ people from the East, they'll bring in Filipinos or Indians and say, right, you're now a salesperson. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just, yeah, work. yeah. It's just the culture clash is so different. It's, uh, 
you know, Indians can sell to Indians, fantastic, right? It, it works really well, um, if that's your space. But yeah, for a lot of companies out here, it's it's very tricky when they do that. They just they just don't understand why they're not getting results. I, I mean, for the Middle East, if, I mean, I, I can imagine that a lot of people from the West won't be able to understand this, but I mean, I've, I've had meetings with, with firms here where um, the, purchaser, the purchasing manager said to me, in an open space, open office, Everyone of his, everyone in the whole department could hear him say, "If you want this contract, either you're giving me woman, money, or uh, alcohol." <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've never. I, that was the first and only time. I think the balls on this man to say it. <laughs> just in whole open office. Just that was amazing to me. It was absolutely amazing to me. Especially, it was one of the big five here in Bahrain. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've never had that. I don't know whether it's my professional way I approach sales, but yeah, I've never had people. Well, I, th- I, th- I think it's also, I mean, I, I mean, you know what they say, textiles and waste management is the worst of the worst. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you find yourself in Bahrain? You mentioned earlier that you spontaneously were in the UK and then you saw an opportunity that arises. I didn't see it. No, I got. I was working for a company called. Um, it was actually a, another company, but working with a company called Sum Total Systems, and then that's an e-learning company. Then, in order to make that whole system work, we were using content. So it's online training content from a mm-hmm. company called Skillsoft, and they had a reseller in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I mean, Saudi. This is this is eleven years ago now, right? So this is a different uh, Saudi. Yeah. No. It's. I mean, I had no idea, right? I, this company in the UK they had this reseller in Saudi who were really underperforming and they said can you go out there and just go and sort them out go and teach them sales do whatever you have to do to get them to sell more right sorry sorry can I ask that sorry so so they went to you Miles and they said oh you have brilliant experience in the Middle East you <laughs> You've been there in and out? There's probably, I mean, there's naivety probably in that, but no, they saw me as an amazing salesperson. They okay. Said, I can sell, I can sell anywhere, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, and they, they were like, why isn't Saudi selling? Now, at the time, I had no idea. I thought I was going to meet camels and, you know. Lazy people. You know, yeah. Or, I got no idea. I was even thinking, shall I bring out my own pen? You know, I had no idea what Saudi Arabia was like. So I came out of there. I said, yeah, sure. I go and spend six months in Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah, completely. I mean, it's, you know, modern skyscrapers, really loads of business, Aramco, you know, biggest client, massive company with all the service companies, tons and tons of stuff going on. Right? So it absolutely blew me away. Um, so yeah, that was back in November of 2011. Mm. And I worked with them for six months and I just ramped up their wholesales. I trained their salespeople, put a new sales process in, um, completely redid their pitch, how they were attacking the market. Um, and just massively increased their sales, right? It's just a hugely successful six months with them. But I mean, I lived in Saudi for a month and then I was... You know, At a compound was, or a hotel or... Just in an apartment block in Kobar. Oh, okay. It was, it was nice because it was right next to the Corniche. So mm. I'd go out walking along the Corniche. But it, in those days, it was different to what it is today, right? I mean, it was, yeah, a bit oppressive, it, right? Yeah, you, it was a you bit... Know the feeling. Draconic. Yeah. So... But after a few weeks, I thought, I wonder what Bahrain's like. So I jumped in the truck and I drove across to Bahrain and it was just like, ah, this place is brilliant. <laughs> it's much more me. Um, so after a month, I started living in Hamala. Mm. Do you know Hamala Beach Resort? Mm. Fantastic place. Absolutely loved it. So, you know, a little beach running and gym and swimming pool. And at the time they had... Not eating carbs. Yeah. They not <laughs> eating any carbs. So, no, I, I mean, I just fell in love with Hamala and the beach and Jazra and that whole area. Janabia, so I just went mountain biking everywhere. Oh, absolutely loved it around there. Um, so I was there for another five months and then I was going to go back to the UK but the problem is, you know this, right? The Middle sure. East is small. It's a village, right? Sure. Everyone knows everyone. So sure. you do a good job like that, and it's like, oh, I want you to double my business. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So I've, bas- I've had five jobs here now, right? Mm. Basically as either head of sales, starting up branch offices or businesses for UK companies or whatever here in, in the Middle East. Um, 
are varying sizes. Some of them are small uh, consulting gigs I've done. Uh, one of them was uh, director of Petroskills Middle East, which is a huge, it's the world's biggest oil and gas, upstream oil and gas training company. Mm. And I was the regional director of that. Um, then I went on to set up uh, the Wally Academy. So Wally is a massive engineering company. Um, I mean, their typical project size is, is you know, one, two billion dollars. So, you know, the, the BMP project, the BAPCO modernization project, they're uh, partners with Technip on, on doing that project. So a huge, huge company, 60,000 people around the world, Australian headquartered. Um, and the, the regional director of that brought me on to start up the Wally Academy which is, you know, their commercial training and consulting arm of Wally here in the Middle East. And so most of your jobs are then, I imagine, word of mouth yeah, from either no, past I, clients or I haven't, meetings since or I've so. been in Bahrain, I haven't applied for a job. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you finish one, people then want another. Now, I mean, the interesting thing is when I finished Wally, um, I then, I went on to just help a local company out here. I worked for them two days a week. But basically I was thinking... I just want some time off, you know, it's the middle of COVID, I've earned this money, I just want to relax for a bit. So a year ago, um, I said, right, I'm stopping that contract, I'm just going to relax. I might go and visit Thailand or sit on a beach for something for a while. And um, yeah, it took me about a week and then I thought, I'm bored now. <laughs> that soon? So, yeah, literally a, a week and I was just bored because I love working. Yeah, I, I know that feeling. But so, uh, so I set up Hypergrowth, and uh, you know that's so. This the last year of my life has been setting up and running that. I find it super, 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 super interesting. And because you use this as a funnel, right, for potential clients to conversion. Well, that's the account. So I do four things. Sure. Okay? Uh, Hypergrowth. And sure. Me, we do four things, right? So, so this is the typical consultancy business: is the Hypergrowth. Yeah, it's a, it's a management consulting firm essentially, because what sure. it's doing is a lot of re-engineering of sales processes and, and sure. coach and stuff like that, right? So I do four things. The first is the hyper growth program. Mm -hmm. That's what I explained to you. So that's a series of workshops, mm -hmm. completely redesign your sales process, your sales pitch, your lead generation and your sales strategy. And that's part of Academy or is that the that, separate no, unit? This is hyper growth. This is my okay. premium. So this is a charged okay. for service. This is my premium service, right? Mm -hmm. So then I work with you for six months. And at the end of six months, we would have doubled your business. Yes. Right, so any small company, we run through the hyper growth program and that's, that's the, my main thing that I offer out into the market. The second thing I offer is, and this is a bit of, I don't know whether WAST is the right word, but people that know me, right, they've seen me perform in sales mm -hmm. and they go, actually, I'd like a bit of miles, right? So this is, often people offer me jobs and I go, I don't want a job, but I'll come in once a week or maybe twice a month and just offer some services, whether that's, um, you know, redesigning your sales process, hiring salespeople for you, um, it's, you know, trying to analyze the market a bit for you, where you should move your company and whether you should be looking at different markets and so on. So it's a bit, you know, a bit of strategy and, or, or even, you know, a bit of help on lead generation. So that's just as a retainer, right? So mm -hmm. I have four or five companies now who just pay me every month and I do stuff sales stuff I'm, I'm basically a fractional CRO mm. right? so if you want to generate a bit more revenue you don't quite know what to do you're a bit stuck you want an extra pair of eyes I come in and help you do that so that's the second service third service which is actually my biggest now it's taken off like hotcakes is my sales meeting service okay right? so this is it's lead generation across three channels right So because there, there's about 20 different b2b channels you can use right there's three that consistently people don't use that for me is easy because i've i've automated it all right so it's outbound email mm -hmm. right so i send about seven and a half thousand emails per week for my clients each outbound linkedin so we do a whole lot of connection and email and outbound really get a buzz on outbound so not posting on linkedin not social media this is outbound high you know, hammered here. You know, Contacting, busy. making sure exactly, people right. are great. And then the third is I get all of my clients to run a monthly webinar. Okay. Right? And you then you use the LinkedIn and the email to heavily push the webinars. One client in Australia, they're now running webinars every two weeks and they're getting 300 people come to each webinar. Oh, fantastic. So the, and these webinars, you just do a, you know, this is me. You just talk about any topic that your, you know, your decision makers would want to come to. 
Uh, and these people, when they, when they finally click these three things and they're getting that many people coming to their webinars, that becomes their sole channel, right? So I run this service and I charge my clients $495 a month. So before, before, you it, go, right? before you go even further into this, I was just going to first ask you, what are three channels or, or one or two channels which you think are the most underused sales channels? What do you think are two, one or two that are most overused? Because I would think cold emailing is probably a little overused. Maybe yeah, not here, not in the Middle East. Sure, okay. sure, 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 if, sure. Yeah, if you, it's it's because it's different. Different ones work. It's it's interesting because different channels work for different industries, industries different sectors, different locations. Geographies, right? yeah. But typically, the three most underused are outbound email, outbound LinkedIn and running a monthly work webinar, webinar, which is also the three things that you're targeting. Makes sense, so right? So I've wrapped them up as a service, $495 a month, off we go. Now, they, I've got 16, 17 clients running this that are absolutely buzzing, absolutely, you know, rocket. I mean, Fantastic. They they, now, they, one of them in Saudi last week rang me up and said, stop giving me so many leads, right? It was too many. Um, the conversion then yeah. becomes an issue, right? <laughs> Absolutely right. So this is my fourth service. This is because once you generate a lot of leads, what do you do with them, right? So what, what I then find is most companies, if, you, if you're doing B2B sales, most companies close about one in 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 yeah, yeah, leads yeah, yeah, come yeah. in, they'll end up with one client. It's yeah. very typical. It should be 50%. It should be one in two, right? So what I've done is you can either go on my hypergrowth program so I can upsell into the hypergrowth program or a lot of people that you know, haven't got the money for that. It's a big, it's a big investment and everything. So what I did is I set up the academy. So that's my fourth service. Well, the hypergrowth academy, right? That's completely free. I run, well, I do it. And because I've got about 14 partners around the world, they all come in and help do training for free as well. Um, basically teach the whole sales system for free. <clears throat> All right, so it's 100% free. Go in there, sign up, and just learn sales, right? You can go through all the courses. Then you build that relationship, and that <coughs> then in turn turns it into a... Exactly. So it, okay. then it becomes another sales channel for people who want to do the sales meeting service or something else. Because I, I love that as a funnel, by the way. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's works a, it, so well. Just give free training. I, I love that. Great. Absolutely. I love that as a funnel. You create the content. You have the academy, you're giving some free training, free resources, right? Got the client interested, and then you can sell them the service. I think that's, that's a fantastic funnel. Fantastic. And would you see the, the, the future of, of the academy? Do you see yourself expanding more into it? Maybe building like a community <laughs> with the guests or, it is, or with... No, it is. I do have guests coming in. Like you could come on. You're more than welcome to come on. That's very sweet of you. Program. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, guests are coming in. I do expert talks, sort of podcasts like this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's tempting to monetize it. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not saying uh, for monetizing. I'm saying <clears throat> from expansion perspective. Oh, I'm kind of happy with it as it is, you know. I'm kind mm -hmm. of, you know. M maybe some uh, more communal work? No? No, I, like <laughs> no, I mean, the academy, I'm investing about four to six hours a week on it. Mm. Right, it's my CSR putting back into the world. The next series of sessions are not even being run by me; they're being run by one of my colleagues from the UK. Um, so you know the business, because whoever runs these sessions is going to pick up the business, right? So they'll pick up some business from it. And do you, oh, okay? Do do you then get a little little handback no, from that? We pass work each other. We, okay, you know our network passes work. Back okay. And forth anyway, no, I mean the reason I'm not going to do the next four is because I've got a a short contract out in Saudi with, with one company, just doing some hands-on work with them for a couple of days. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, so brilliant. so from all the people who, who are working sales jobs or more traditional sales jobs, you know, the common thing that I always think about is, you know, the typical car salesman. You know, that's, that's the, always the... Yeah, uh, very pr it's, it's an amazing profession. Door-to-door -door salesman, car salesman, these types of people really do the cold calling in call centers. These, if you can learn sales at that level, you can then do consultative sales and kick out. Everything becomes easier later on. It's, that, it's good to cut your teeth on that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I always think of that famous movie script, ABC, <clears throat> always be closing. <laughs> it's completely stuck in my head. I, I mean, I, I love the, the, the academy part. And are, 
you're you're centered yourself around Bahrain. Have you never thought about doing maybe something more in the in Dubai or anything like that? I do. I mean, I've got a couple of clients in Dubai. Okay, but, but Dubai is a different market. You see, if I mean, clearly every every country in the GCC is very different, right? So if you look at Dubai, who's who's running small businesses and who's doing the sales? It's typically Westerners, right? Absolutely. Whereas here in Bahrain, it's Bahrainis, right? So is it, it though? Yeah, most of them, of course. It's a lot of, them, of Indians. Most, yeah, yeah, but most. I mean, I've, I mean, I've never, I've never met a purchasing, um, I never met a purchasing manager who wasn't Indian. <laughs> not, not yet. In, in the bigger companies, yeah. So yeah. When when you're employed, but I'm talking small to medium sized companies in Bahrain. There's fifty thousand of them, right? Mm. The majority are Bahraini owned, as far as I know. They're, you know, they're. Sure. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm not talking corner shops and you know cold stores and things like this, but service businesses running e-commerce sites and stuff like that are typically Bahraini owned and run and it's these companies that I'm targeting to help sell right so it's if it's in Saudi it's Saudis if it's Bahrain it's Bahrain if it's Oman it's Omanis so my my system and approach works really well whereas Dubai typically those are foreigners they, they've learned sales they're already coming in so the whole you know the market in Dubai for helping people with sales just isn't as much because they've already gone to all the western courses and the, and the stuff like that so it's, there's less yeah, opportunity it's just, yeah. yeah it's you know I've, i can't i try and avoid it dubai really it's really too, yeah i mean i like it somewhere to visit but in terms of business it's too really i'm yeah. surprised by that because considering you know behind the thing i think that lacks Bahrain the most is the lack of activities there's things to do, but not like in the same scale oh, or you mean volume. To live well. To be quite honest, I prefer Bahrain to Dubai. Anyway, there's much more to do here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, have, you have to look for it a bit harder. Yeah. But what is there to do in Dubai, really? Oh, tons of stuff. Well, you name a list. Yeah. Uh, sand surfing, water oh, surfing, uh, jet skiing. Jet skiing, to be fair, exists here as well. But not on the same scale or niceties, right? The beaches are way, way nicer. They have a whole like beach community as well with all those restaurants and stuff. The beaches are nice here. Too. Yeah, but they don't it have like be. they have improved. But here we've got forts, castles. There, there's a lot more um, local stuff, local art. Largest building in the world. Uh, uh, the newest wonder with a frame of Dubai. Do you know what? When I go I, I'm Dubai, selling Dubai heart at this moment. I'm selling Bahrain, right? <laughs> If I go to Dubai after two days, I feel I've done it. Because I've, I've been here 11 years and I'm still finding new things in Bahrain. I, I feel like if you stay in Bahrain for two weeks, you've, you've seen every mall that has to offer. <laughs> <laughs> Take a week at the mall and the coffee shops. What are you left with? Uh, what do I love here? Um, Pearling Trail in Maharak. Mm -hmm. uh, Sakia Mountains. Have you climbed up to the top of those? No. Stunning view from up there. Can you even access those things? Of course you can. You can see that you can see both the east and west coast at the same time from the top of that mountain. I call it a mountain; it's a hill, but it's that's beautiful up there. Go is up that there near the where the, the the tree of life is? Yeah, yeah. So it's, you okay. come down to the tree of life and in, inland. Yeah, it's it's about level with the tree of life. What what do you think about that whole area, Dora? I think it's called or Doha. Yeah. That, there's some amazing. Have you seen the prison cells that were built in the cliff down there? Oh no, I didn't like. There's I didn't explore those things. Down there, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, is it like 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 my head? It's I think of like a Texan, you know, 1980s West cowboy prison. Is it like with metal bars and stuff uh, like that? Uh, really? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, the, the doors are not there anymore, but. Yeah, oh, that's they good. Actually built into the cliff. They, I think historically they put the mad people there. The, you know the insane people. Okay. They took them down there and locked them away down there. But yeah, it's a spooky place. Uh, I can imagine so. But there is a lot of you know the drilling rigs and oil and gas and nodding donkeys and stuff like that. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Flames coming out. There's also a secret military base around there as well. Yeah, where they, further, that's a bit further south. Yeah, 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 yeah. They covered it with like trees and stuff like that. We're like, that's not very secretive. <laughs> <laughs> and you have like a really weird Indian community somewhere around there as well. They have like, they have like, like, like it's like a farm they have down there somewhere. Okay. Dan, you know what I'm talking about, right? 
Yeah, right? And they have like dogs and stuff like that. And it's this whole weird thing. I see. There's tons of... They've still got more things to explore. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that you don't need to go and see or witness or experience. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with touristy stuff. Go look at the largest <laughs> building in the world. Uh, I prefer Bahrain to Dubai. It's much more, much more for me here. I, I couldn't, I couldn't disagree <laughs> with you more. Um, yeah, and have you, you've you've only lived what six months, I think, at the most in Saudi at one period, or have you lived a little longer? No less. I mean, it was really a month because then I started living in in Bahrain as I finished my contract. As I so for, for that six months contract, one month I lived in Saudi, five mm. months I lived in Bahrain. And how how was that for your wallet? Because I imagine living in Saudi was probably the the smarter financial move to make. But I lived in Hamala Beach, right? So, I mean, it was, what did you spend money on? And I remember um, the, you're doing like 12 hour days, right? So you're getting up at four or five in the morning. Mm. The causeway was busy then, right? It was a very, the causeway now is like easy, right? Then you had to hit it before 6 a.m. Otherwise you'd never get across, right? So 6 a.m. on the causeway, you're in work at 7, 7.30, you got a full on day, you know, client meetings, teaching the team, all the rest of it. So by the time you get back home, easily six, seven o'clock at night, Christ right? So almighty. you're doing that, you know, long, long days. How and long then, was your travel? Two hours there and back every day? Depended on the causeway. And though, I mean, sometimes it was four hours to get back on a Thursday. Jesus uh, Christ. Well, it was, it was different then, of course. When I first came, it was uh, the weekend was Thursday, Friday and in Saudi, it was all different. Yeah, yeah, that's all changed now. It's all changed now. So it's it was originally done in order to to match more Western business, you know. Um, do you think it's going to change again? Do you think we'll go like Dubai is done? Agree on a single calendar? Maybe. I think you know what? I think I think I think screw it. Have everything open twenty four seven. What does it matter then? Forget weekends. Get rid of it. No one needs it. I'm the opposite, you see. I'm a big advocate of a four-day working week. Okay. Because if you have everything open all the time, you get burnout, right? But if people are working seven days a week, that's, you can only do that for so long, right? And a lot of, a lot of people do. Um, it, historically, there was no, you know, if you go back far enough, everyone worked seven days a week. That was normal. Then we have the holy day. So people work for six days a week. Then, and it wasn't that long ago, some bright spark said, actually, let's have a two-day weekend. But it was made up. It's a human thing to have a two-day weekend. Henry Ford was the first person to introduce the the two-day weekend. Fantastic, right? Five-day work week. I didn't know that. That's phenomenal. Right. Well, Miles O'Connor is going to introduce the three-day weekend, right? Yeah. (laughs) Because, look, you have a weekend, right? You're working really, really hard. Most of us have got really stressful jobs, right? The first day of your weekend, your brain is still thinking of work. It mm-hmm. takes you a day to stop thinking. So then you get to the second day of the weekend, you relax for a bit, and then your brain is thinking, oh, I've got to work again tomorrow. Uh, so a two-day weekend, you get very little time to, to really rest, right? You have a three-day weekend. It's actually, it feels like three times longer than a two-day weekend. And where would you put the, 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 fir- the first day? What has Dubai done? Dubai's done... What, what have they done? They've got fright there. How have they done it? I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert of Dubai, to be <laughs> honest. Um, uh, I can tell you, I would manage it. I don't know how Dubai's done it. I mean, you mean they, they maybe gave Thursday, Friday, Saturday? I think, no, they, cause they, wanted, they wanted to do an alignment with the West. So they've done... I think half day Friday, for government, right? So it's mm-hmm. half day Friday, and then Saturday, Sunday off. Right, so it's basically two and a half day weekend, I think they're doing now. Because my counter argument to yours would probably be Monday, Tuesday, work. Wednesday, off. Thursday, Friday, work. <laughs> but and then brain, Friday, Saturday, you off. You have to reset your mind into a different different thing. So one day, it just isn't enough. If you have one day off, it's... Mm-hmm. Do you, do you not you still look at email? You'll still be thinking of work, and you, you yeah. Just, but if you have three days off, you're still looking at your emails and you're still doing work. Yeah, I think people would become because you, you'd put in very strict rules with it. So the four days, the really strict rules. Who's going to supervise this? Look, <laughs> employees, right? Companies, yeah. right? Because most people, when they have a 
a job that's like an eight or nine hour day, they're really only working four or five hours full, really full on. The rest of it, maybe two, yeah. Friends, looking at Facebook, whatever, right? So maybe two. <laughs> Let's not go. There. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I so it think, makes sense. If, they would need a lot of time off. If you have a four day week, you need extra rules. You need to really focus people. You need really need to get a full day's work, right? There's no messing around, no bullshit. But in return for working really, really hard, really productively for four days, you then can have three days off. So I think it it shifts your whole mind into this is work, let's get work done, let's really go for it. And then three days off each week, it'd be great. I think right. people people would just get lazy and after <laughs> after the after maybe let's say ten years of having the four day week, like oh. God, I can't wait till it's Thursday. <laughs> that's how that will that's how that's gonna happen, I think. I think it's natural progression. We'll go that way. Who Ops- knows way. I'm totally opposite to you. I think seven days a yeah. week, 24 <laughs> hours, live, breathe your work. And if you don't like it, find something you like. <laughs> yeah, that's most startup people, isn't it? That's a very... I, I don't know if it's most startup people. I think if you love what you do, you don't feel like you're working, right? Your body knows you're working. <laughs> but I, I think you still enjoy it, you know? It's it's like Japan has this really weird concept of of work, not just the the crazy hours, but anything that you become a master at, and it doesn't matter whatever the craft is, they deem that as meaningful work, which is a fascinating concept. You know, if you if you're just a woodcutter, if you do it very masterfully, then they deem that as as a serious enterprise. I like that. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't find the UK. You wouldn't. You wouldn't look at a farmer and be like, "Oh yeah, that's a serious enterprise." You'd look, you'd look at him and be like, "Oh fucking hell, was he still being a farmer for?" People do underestimate most professions, don't they? Whenever you look at a profession, I mean, farming is a great example. There's so much science. There's so much business. There's so much competition. There's so much technology that you need to know. But they're all dead, mate. They're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dead. If you have to, you know how expensive those seeds are that you have to buy them because they're genetically altered and stuff like that. By the way, the laws that surround those seeds are mental. Like if you don't use the the seed at a specific date of crop, as when you have to put them in the in the soil or planting plantation them, uh, you're you're not you're not allowed to use that seed. So if you pass that due date, you're breaking the contract. And they actually have like people who come and inspect. Which seeds you're using? That's amazing. Yeah. It's 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 really really mental. Like a lot of farmers will tell you, and they're crying because they can hardly make ends meet. Well, but then again, I've never heard of a poor farmer either. But you know, so I th- I think I think that all that whole profession is kind of disappearing, and that's all going to be taken over by big businesses. Famously, back uh, BlackRock right now is buying up a lot of properties in order to do exactly that, uh, since. Rent is usually the main contributing factor for increase of salary. So what BlackRock has done for their client list is saying, hey, look, we're going to buy up large areas of apartments where your employees are at, and we'll make sure to cap the rent. So therefore, you don't have to pay them a larger salary. Genius, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just deal with the things I can do. No, 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 no. Sorry, 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 sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess you see why why it's called Unsolved Truths, right? (laughs) No, no. But yeah, Miles. So what's any plans otherwise in the future? No, not really. I'm just, uh, you know, focused on getting the company a bit better. Um, Improving that and just enjoying Bahrain. Do you have any staff? No, no. No staff either. So how many hours are you working these days? A lot, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no, it's not too bad. I mean, it's a, t- a typical day for me. I'd be up at, you know, four or five in the morning, um, do some of my work, then relax, read a paper, have a break. Um, and then during the week, different days are different. So sundays are pretty easy mondays is a client day i try and book all my client meetings on a monday so monday's full on um but yeah and i'll do a whole load of work during the day and then take some time out do something like this you know it's nice go shopping during the day um and then normally back in the evening do a few hours back in the evening so it's uh 
No, I mean, I've set this up to enjoy myself a bit as well, you know. It's okay, like, there we go. That's There, there we go. You know, I'm not a... Yeah, I certainly don't aspire to be a Richard Branson or Elon Musk. That's not what I want to do with this business. This is much more around, let's see how many small companies I can help sell more. So why was your target a thousand people then? I just made it up. There okay. You just, if you don't have a target, you don't know what you're going for, do you? And so what happens when you hit a thousand? You're going to increase it to 10,000? <laughs> <laughs> are you just going to walk away and be like, you know what, I've done it now? <laughs> I don't know. You, do you know what? Probably I need... I'm, really really good at sales if you want to double your sales give me a call right sure i probably need a business coach right? okay. because i'm you know i can see the business is you know going to be successful going to earn some money but yeah where i take it in the next five ten years these are the questions you're asking i've got no idea Who's no I, I mean so. i think it's a brilliant concept i think you're offer a great service and i think i think more people could benefit from it i just think that you know I mean, one option I have been considering is franchising it. Mm. So find some young Bahrainis like Dan over there who want to get into marketing and sales. He's Indian, but sure. Uh, <laughs> true, true. I, Wait, I'm are you Indian then or, any... or Bangladeshi? Bangladeshi, right? What? Are you Indian or Bangladeshi? Sri Lankan. Sri Lankan. <laughs> so we're all wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Look, any nationality. His father's like a priester, though. Oh. Am I right with that? Fuck, I'm wrong at two for two. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. <laughs> I feel embarrassed now. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, no, I help. You know, I really don't care where people come from. If you want to start a franchise and a business, but like, that could be a really good uh, approach to do it from here. Because now I've set it all up to bring in people and say, look, copy paste is your version of hyper growth. Why not get all the young people? I think I think there I think I think you're missing opportunities by just franchising it out. Um, what would you do? Give me some business advice there, Hamad. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to give you unsolicited <laughs> advice. I feel no, bad no, now. No, sorry. No. I mean, you look. Put it this way: I've had jobs my whole life. Right? Mm-hmm. I've been working for other people. Mm-hmm. Um, running my own company is literally one year experience, right? This is, so this is new for me, right? And yeah, I've made it a success, but I'm sure I could do a lot more. You've run companies for a long time, haven't you? Yes. Like, so no, your advice is welcome. No, I appreciate it, but uh, I mean, it all depends where you want to go. A company is only as good as its people. And right now the company is only you and potentially a few of your mates who are, you know, pitching in and wanting to get their own clients moving. So I, I think if, if, if you're genuinely about, you know, building a community or building help or helping people and it's just not just a profit center, then looking at it from a perspective of, hey, you know what, maybe I'll, I'll set this up like a course. So I bring up Scott Galloway because he, he does something similar. He teaches brand strategy. And I think something like this could but potentially work. Exist. Why, you know, I mean, I'm, it, but this is brand strategy, though. This is nothing to do with... with uh, with uh, using Cardone University, right? That's that's kind of what we'd be competing with. It, it, it already exists. It's just type in Cardone University, C A R D O N E. He's charging a hundred dollars a month. Oh, these things make a fortune. They do, don't they? How much are you charging again a month? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to say? Well, no, I mean, it's all all the. All the services are different, right? So sure. lead generation is the cheapest. It's four hundred and ninety-five dollars a month. Okay. Um, How did he come up with that number? It's a combination of what the market will bear as a very easy sale. I mean, when I speak to small businesses about it, I mean, he's a snake oil salesman. Yeah. Okay, we can agree to that. All right. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, but the thing is, what I'm doing is really practical. It's not. This is. You, the problem with sales training is everyone who I've just done sales training for and then walk away, do you know what their improvement is in sales? Zero, right? Because if you, it's a bit like giving you a bicycle and I'll stand there for an hour telling you everything about that bicycle. These are the brakes, these are the pedals, this is how the gears work. Off you go. You'll fall off. Right. Mm. It's the only way to learn to ride a bike is to ride a bike. The only way to learn sales is you've got to actually do it. Action right? over emotion. So that's why my program six months, because it doesn't matter how good you are at teaching sales. You, to be quite honest, 
all of the stuff at the beginning, you could probably just say, go and have a look at some videos, look at YouTube, go and learn a theory, and then boom, let's start doing the implementation. Okay. Because that's when you're going to learn sales, when you're actually doing it, and then week in, week out, you analyze what you did, what worked, what didn't work, then next week you improve everything and, and, and you know, just keep on improving week after week. Uh, it's uh, the only way to do it. Do you find a lot of people when you're going through a sales course have almost like either a fear of success or, or they're scared of rejection? Who are actually going through a sales course? What yeah. do you mean? Who are... Who are going through the through your your training per se the one on one? Okay. Do you feel like a lot of these people because they've never, as you mentioned, ninety nine percent of the companies you work with have never gone through a proper sales training course. Do you feel like the participants of it are just? No, exactly the opposite. Really? So at the end of it. Um, Not the end of it. I mean, in the beginning, as you meet them. No, but I think the, the the journey is right. You you spoke about sales as um. A type of journey. I, I feel like I'm the tour guide, right? Mm. Taking people through through this whole sales journey. So, for you, know, I mean, when you're doing sales, it's you are signposting each person to the next step and taking. As long as you say, look, after this meeting, we're going to have another meeting on Tuesday, and we're going to make a decision. Is that okay with you? They go, yeah, sure, right. So if you signpost the next step and take people along that journey, they'll follow you. Now, when I when I onboard a client into into the hypergrowth program, it's very much the same thing. I'm taking them on a journey. So people only respond to my um, outbound messages or workshops or whatever I'm doing to generate leads if they know they've got a sales problem. Hmm. All right. So if if you're running a company and you think your sales are perfect, you wouldn't get in touch with me, right? Because there's no need to improve. Sure. If you're a small business owner and you actually go you know, the one thing that we really need to fix is sales. And to be quite honest, it is the most important thing. What's the most important thing for any small business? You need revenue, you need money, right? Sales is the most important thing you need to fix, right? So if, if a business owner recognizes that and then they come to me, yeah, no, I very quickly take them through that journey to, <clears throat> you know, they're seeing the value, they're seeing what I can deliver and then yeah, as soon as they start, as soon as they start with me, they get really, really excited. Well, well because so it's a the, total eye opener for people. The reason I brought up the subject, and the reason I phrased the question, I think this way, is because I've also worked with, with, with you know, both when I used to work for people and now as a business owner, with staff who are just so afraid of rejection, especially in cold calling. They almost oh I see you like, know actually doing sales and yeah, yeah because they they I mean you know you tell them you know every no leads to a yes you know don't be discouraged you're gonna call people people are gonna reject it some people may even yell and say you know why are you bothering me and stuff like that right and he said as long as you practice you know you go through your script you make sure you're you're you've got your your key information we normally try or this is how I normally do it we normally try to only choose clients that we have either some past experience with a one or two person connection, right? So if I know like person A, and then I try to get business with person B or potentially person C, but I need some sort of connection. So somebody like, oh, hi, is this Dave? You know, I, I work with blah, 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 you know, and he passed me over your information and I think we could maybe do something good for you and we could do like a good fit. And then usually that's how that expands. Yeah, so I think what you're describing there is the difference between cold calling mm -hmm. and gold calling, right? Okay. So if, if you, a, a, a cold calling is literally, they've never heard of you, new company, you're just calling up out of the blue, and that's a horrible way. To, most people don't like that, right? And my clients, if they don't like it, I just say don't do it. Most staff don't like doing it either. Then just don't do it because there are so many sales channels you can use, right? So, um, I mean, some people who don't like cold calling actually are really good at knocking on doors. So I'll give you an example here in Bahrain, right? I was here working for a health and safety training company. What did I do? I got in the car. I drove to Citra Industrial Estate, right? Go up to the first company, knock on the door, go in the company start my pitch going on boom and then of course wait 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 sorry 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 i won't believe that for a second i ain't brilliant. having i ain't I, having none of it i 
what you do then, right, it's very simple, right? You try and close a deal selling safety training, right? And it's, I mean, it's cold, it's off the street, the conversion's not that high, but I did sell quite a lot in CETA industrial estate. But what the trick is, right, what you do at the end of that meeting is you say, well, is there anyone else here? Have you got any friends? And of course, everyone there knows everyone else, right? Why don't you try this company? Why don't you pop into Garmco? Why don't you go down there? Boom, 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 into all these different companies. So you walk so, in without a meeting and you... you... Yeah, a Ramco. I okay. used to get one meeting in a Ramco. I always used to set it at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't leave a Ramco until, <laughs> until evening, right? Because... As soon as you're getting near the end of a meeting, what, who, who else in Aramco is, is in this line of work? Who else do you work with, right? Could, could I see them? And they'd actually ring them up. They'd say, oh, I've got this great guy here. Oh, could he pop along and see you? And is there anyone else, right? So from each meeting, to you department. Can two or three other meetings, right? So in Aramco, I'd be there for the whole day. Easily, right? So I, I ain't having none of it. I ain't having none of it. I, I believe the second part. I don't believe the first yeah, part. When I was working for another training company, I did three days in Riyadh. I did 21 sales meetings. You're pulling my leg. Days, right? So <laughs> you can do this if you're just, if you're a bit of energy and you're a bit sparky and you actually, now to me, that's not cold calling because if someone's recommended, oh, you should go and see this person in Almorai Foods, sure. right? You go across and see them. That's now a warm meeting because you've been referred, right? So it's a referral. So it's a very different meeting. Ah, oh, so Ahmed sent you over saying you can do this. Tell me about it, right? So it's a, yeah, that's gold calling, right? If you're retargeting referrals or something like that, where you're ringing someone up or getting connected, and gold calling is, is yeah, it's a really, really good. We, yeah, we, we try to do as much research on a potential, you know, victim, client, <laughs> <laughs> prey, <laughs> whichever adjectives you like using. Uh, so yeah, and then we, we usually just put our fangs at them. So yeah, I mean, uh, what fascinates me, though, and I won't have any of it, you cannot, I, I will not believe you went into a firm or business without prior having setting a meeting and just showing up and be like, hey, yeah, uh, you know, who's in charge here? So in how did that Cedar, work? In C2 Industrial Estate, what I used to always ask, I'd say, how many salespeople have come into your department in, in the last year? And they'd look at me and they'd like, no oh. one. Let's say, when did the last time a salesperson just turn up selling this type of service? Uh, two years ago? No, people, people did that? People don't do it. People don't just get off their butt, go in, damn, I'm industrial estate. My, so my, my, my granddad went... Like, why aren't people doing this now? I don't know. It's, the fastest way to generate sales is just go and knock on doors, right? It's just brilliant. My granddad used to just <laughs> knock on doors and sell vacuum from door to door. Why not? I, I, I mean, this was, you know, the 1940s, 1950s, right? I, I can't imagine it working out. I can't work, imagine walking around London with a bag of knives, <laughs> knocking on door and saying, Miss, have you seen these knives? Look, I'll give you an example of how it works today with modern technology, okay? Go to Abu Dhabi, right? Yeah. Well, you know the energy center, the oil center, where all of the uh, opcos are on, on the Corniche, right? Have one meeting with someone finish the meeting, come down into reception, right, in any one of the buildings along the front there. Go to LinkedIn, look at, uh, I've just been with Adco, this is now Adma, right, so who's head of HR of Adma? Go back to the reception desk, hi, could I speak to Ahmed al Ghasaibi from uh, Adma? Have you got an appointment? No, no, I'm just passing through. Uh, I've got a really important brochure I want to drop off with him. Okay, okay, well, ring him up. Here's the phone. So you ring him up, <laughs> I've just been to see, you know, Ali from, from you know, your, your accounting or whatever, yeah. sure. So now, uh, you know, I'm just here. I just thought I'd quickly pop up with a brochure and just explain what I'm doing here with Ali. Okay, yeah, pop up, just five minutes. Okay, no problem, just five minutes. Boom, you're in another sales meeting. So, and, and Abu Dhabi is brilliant because all of the oil and gas companies, they're all... You, you know what? We, we, okay. Just, see, again, you spend the whole day there. No, no, no. no. Listen, listen, this is what, this is what we're going to do. Why don't people do that? This is what we're, this is what we're going to do. We've got cameras. We've got gear. We're going to follow this process because I ain't having none of it. And we'll do... We, you, know those, you know those like spy cameras, those ones with the pens on, you know, and stuff like that? We'll, we'll set this whole thing up <laughs> because people will pay gold to see this. And I think that's entertaining as, as hell. And I, I can't believe you, 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 you were able to, to hustle your way in. <laughs> it's easy, easy. And I mean, the thing is, 
because I've been here 11 years in the Middle East, I've got 30,000 connections on LinkedIn. So if someone says, here's a company, who do I speak to? It's like, I can find them. They're normally first or second connection, you know, at that level. So it's brilliant. It's like you just, yeah, in the modern day, you use a bit of technology help and stuff. It's not a wheelbarrow and some sharp knives, but. And you ever worked? And you, you never worked at the. Uh, at the uh, I mean, stories like this makes me think of this MI6 and all that kind of nonsense. <laughs> the sheer. Uh, uh, I don't know what the right word is. <laughs> don't know, but that that cold calling, knocking on doors, is the fastest way to get business. But people don't like doing it, right? So the type of sales that I've done, a lot of people don't like. If you said get in a car and go to Damam Industrial Estate for the day, they'd be like. They don't like it, right? So that's why you look at all of the other channels. Because I've d- channels. when I when I when 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 the uniform business is the first few years, that's exactly what I did, by the way. Brilliant. And I and I went to these. Uh, I went to potential clients. I went to look, check out their facilities. I went to look. You know, I went to look at their st- staff, what the uniforms they're wearing. I went inside. You know, you know. Who, by the way, um, is the manager Ahmed still here? And they would be like, Ahmed who? It's like, oh, I have terrible memory. I don't remember his last name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and they'd be like, no, uh, Ahmed isn't in, 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 in whatever position. I was like, who's in position now then? I'd be like this, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd be like, oh, okay. Do you know if any chance he's free? And they'd be like, free? Why? Why? And I'd be like, oh, I, you know, I do a uniform business and blah, blah, blah. And um, I just want to see if I can just drop by and just, you know, talk to two words with him. And so that that existed, but it never was like very successful from from my end. It was always like, yeah, you know, wasta, this kind of stuff, right? But uh, I, I've I've never experienced anyone else who has been successful at <laughs> doing the craft. <laughs> the black magic, I love it. I love it. <laughs> no, I used to I used to love that. I must admit, I don't do that anymore. That's not the way I do business now. But you know, oh. back then was yeah, that's fastest way to start things up and and how, how what kind of contracts were you procuring at that kind of they varied i mean some of them were fifty thousand dollars some of them were half a million from from just walking in yeah 100 percent. I, I cannot believe that no because you're speaking to you know head of hr sure head of training they're you know happy happy or, or you know you look at to big companies in Saudi, they're responsible for tens of millions of dollars of training. So for you, just slot a few extra training courses in, yeah, simple. And and how would how would that process go from meeting them into closing that deal? How long would that reference be? You're closing at the moment you're walking in? I won't believe that. <laughs> so, some of them you do. Some of them really? Is, yeah, they've got this need and you've come in with a, a product and they've just gone, yeah, we'll just take that. But no, the, the majority would be a couple of months. Yeah. Um, that sort of solution sale. Um, one of them was two years. I mean, you know, so, some of them are... How did you put up with that? Right. You kind of, right. There are four things in sales that are fundamental to, to, to really understand, right? When you're doing you sales it. pitch and when you're, when you're going forward, right? So this is particularly just in sales pitch and, and when you're speaking and your mindset. The first is fear, right? So really create a fear of loss. So if they don't do business with you, they're going to lose out big time, okay? So then the next one's urgency. So you really try and push hard for urgency, okay? Then the next one's greed. So by doing this, this is what they're going to... Typically in the Middle East, it's if you do this, you're probably going to get a promotion. It's going to make you look so good. I promise to double promotion. your business. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You got it, right? Yeah. Love it. So work with me, I'll double your business. That's the greed, right? Absolutely fantastic one. But the fourth one, which is just game-changing, which people don't use, is indifference. Okay. So if I'm selling you... Look, I'm going to come in and work with you and, and I'm going to, in six months, I'm going to double your business. But do you know what, Hamid? It's entirely up to you whether you decide. It's your decision. Right? So I'll tell you what, have the weekend to think about it, right? And then we'll meet again on, on Monday next week. Um, you can let me know whether you want to go ahead or not. But, you know, it'd be exciting if we did work together, but it's entirely up to you. Do you put the urgency with it? Do you go, you know what? Yeah, but I, that's I, what I'm saying. So, you know, just let, few, let's meet in a few days' time. How, how long do you need to think about this? Just the weekend? Okay, well, then, you know, so you're, you're you know. You're, yeah, yeah, you hit the urgency and you hit the indifference, both yeah. two for one. But the indifference is just so powerful because it really, it spurs people into action. It's, it changes selling things into people want to buy from you. And that's, 
of any sales trick in the book, that's the fundamental one you've got to get right in 2022 and going forward. If you try and sell something, if I say, oh, this is the best cigar in the world, it's got all these great things in it, brilliant flavor, you're just like, so what if I say, yeah, this is, this is the most exclusive cigar, you know, probably can't afford it, but. That's exactly know, what Chanel uses. That's know, ingenious, yeah. Yeah, do, do you know what? I mean, you know, I can tell, I'm gonna keep it, I think, you know. Mm. There you go. Now you actually want it more, don't you? You're like, it's yours. <laughs> no, it's your gift to you. I know. I know what you're getting at. <laughs> it's just you know, if you don't want it, it's fine. And say, oh, I'm going to keep it. I'm, I'll have it if you don't want it. I yeah. love it. No, I want it. I love it. So yeah, indifference is 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 fundamental. So don't if you try and sell things to people. Again, in cold calling, a lot of people make that mistake. They ring. Oh, we've got this great product. You just like, you just hang up, don't you? Boom. All right. Whereas if you're very much more consultative and asking questions, you know, so exactly, you know, what, what, you know, how much do you spend on uniforms every year? And, you know, how do you find the quality of your current supplier? You know, if you start asking questions that people are interested, they want to buy from you. I totally agree. Right. I totally, totally agree. I totally so, yeah, agree. Fuji factors, they're called. F-U-G-I, Fuji factors. But yeah, there's a ton of, ton of other things in there about asking questions and, do you use spin selling? Do you ever use any spin selling techniques? No. What we do try is do up sales. Okay. So okay. We, we, we usually say, you know what, so if it's a larger like company, usually what happens is they want to, they want to renegotiate every three months, every quarter basically, right? And so what we then try is to upsell and say, listen, this is the price right now. And if we can secure the entire yearly contract, I can give you 15% discount we can upsell it. And if you don't take it, you know, I'm not sure if I can offer you that same price again in six months down the line. And you might have to go with somebody else that you don't really have trust with, that you don't really have reference with. So, you know, it's up to you. That's up, how we normally do it. Upselling and cross-selling are two really underutilized things <laughs> as well. So upselling is, is brilliant. Cross-selling is something people just fail to do. I don't know why. Most companies have a variety of products and services, and they don't Couple it. map out all their current clients. And it's really interesting because you think your clients know what you do. They don't. They're running their company. They've got no idea what other products and services you do. So if you go along and say, oh, we also do fishing or whatever it is, right? They'd be like, oh, really? So yeah, cross-selling is brilliant as well as upselling. I, I mean, as long as you have a good relationship, I mean, more here, here in the Middle East than in the West, you can really you knock on that door. Absolutely. And you can really like do all kinds of businesses and, and just really yeah. home on that business, as long as you have that connection. Yeah. But yeah, brilliant, brilliant. You know, once you've done your cold calling and bashing in the industrial estates, whatever else you're doing, yeah, it's then much more referrals and how well you perform and, you know, sales becomes a lot, not easier, but just a bit more different and a bit more chilled, doesn't it? Yeah. My, I mean, I, I, the, the hardest thing from, from my perspective was always the staff because tr training staff isn't ever easy mm. because some people are really not meant for sale. They don't have really the gift of gab. You know, especially if somebody's a little uncomfortable on the phone call. And it more now, I think, than ever before, because hardly any anyone talks talks <laughs> anymore, right? They all just WhatsApp and LinkedIn and all that. It can be great channels, though. Instagram is also another fantastic channel. People, you know, so. And what we do, actually, for, for, the, for the LinkedIn, uh, for the textiles one, is I have a bot. Okay. And I set a script with the bot. So what it does is it looks through through my connection list and then sees who is connected with me. Then it try, then it then it attacks messages. People attacks. that are the people that I'm not connected with but we share one connection with. Okay. Right? And then it's then it automatically just sends like 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 a, a, a message saying hey blank whatever their name is. It just takes that that information from their contact sheet and puts it in. And saying, I see that you have worked in X industry, puts that information in. Uh, you know, I got your referral by X person who was in contact with, right? And I think we could maybe work something out. Or I think, you know, I have an opportunity for you. Or I think blah, 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 blah. And then it just sends that off. And then after three weeks, no, not after three weeks, sorry, after three days or four days, it sends a second message if there's not been a reply saying, hey, you know what, I just want to check in again. I hope you're not ignoring me. 
you know, I, uh, <laughs> especially when you say, I hope you're not ignoring me, people for whatever reason immediately want to respond because non- nobody wants to look like they're, they're um, not being unkind, you know? No, that's no, a but, clever trick. Exactly. And so, so the, the, at, at the same time, the bot now just runs. <clears throat> Whenever somebody's like, a event happens or post, it just automatically likes it. It creates engagement. Um, it recommends people for awards, you know, because you have that thing like for communication or whatever, whatever, whatever. Outbound LinkedIn is, is gold dust at the moment. It's, it will have its time. I reckon give it one or two years of running. I think more and more people are clocking onto it and you will get a bit spammy and a bit too much. But for now, it's, yeah, it's, it's still good. It, yeah. It's still good. It's still good. It's going to be replaced sooner or later by the next thing. And I don't know what the next thing is going to be. Uh, but it, it, right now, e- e LinkedIn is still in this, this beautiful stage where you can still naturally grow without having to spend money. Yeah. And I think that's going to disappear soon. I, don't, I, I think when you post stuff and stuff like that, it'll be like Instagram. If you're not, if you're not paying money to, to have your post reach people, you're just not going to grow. Mm, yeah, all of Facebook, they've all done that now, haven't they? they spend a fortune. Yeah, I mean, you know, but they make a killing. I, I there's I don't remember who it was, but there's a guy who 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 uses Facebook in a really interesting way, in that he creates two separate posts. One is just to raise engagement, so he he will make a post with I would say it's a handbag company, and it'll just be like explaining the product, showing it some very you know sexy pictures from different angles, and he'll pay let's say I don't know a thousand dollars for just reach, and then he'll set up a second script. That will that will hit people about I think seven days to five days with a call to action, but with the same almost images, but not exactly the same, just similar. And he says it, it, the conversion rate is almost thirty percent. Okay, that's clever. I'd have to look at that. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll try to find you the guy who 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 uh, taught me about it. I've never personally tried it, but uh, he, he swears by it. So Facebook used to do a service. So you could actually type in a product. So type in, uh, like, let's say type in, I don't know, scrubs. And it will show you where the most popular posts with that keyword. So if you're typing shoes or handbag or whatever, there you go. Scrub supply. Isn't that, cl- isn't that good? You know what? I mean, I... I never use Facebook ads or LinkedIn. I don't spend one dinar on ads because the other channels are just much better return on investment. Do you really think so? For, yeah. For, if, if you're doing B2C, or so look, if your deal size is $100, right? Sure. 30 dinars, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, Instagram ads, all of this is, is you have to do it, right? It's, if you're running e-commerce, this type of business, you have to do ads, right? As soon as you're doing a deal size of 10,000 dinars and above, none of your decision makers are looking at ads. They're not on Facebook. They're not, they're just, it's a different, a whole different mindset, a different way of doing it. If you, put it this way, if you spend thousands and thousands of dinars on Facebook ads trying to do B2B sale, A, you'll waste your money. B, the leads that you'll get will be really... Oh, there we tire kickers. They just oh, saw the ad and just thought I'd click on it and have a think about it. I totally but agree the, with that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with the, that. For, for B2B businesses, my advice is, unless you're doing something really specific, so say, say globally you're selling a widget and it's the only widget in the whole world, you know, then yeah, do because people will find it and, and click on it. But yeah, for 99 B2B, 99% of B2B businesses, my advice is don't spend any money on ads. No, I agree with I, <laughs> Wow. Well, um. It just doesn't work. Because if you spend that money instead, right, on podcasts or doing, you know. Content. Yeah, just getting Educational. people workshops and, you know, paying someone like me to do some more email <laughs> and stuff, you know. It's, it's you heard a, that, folks. So <laughs> it, it, <laughs> if that's not a hard sale, then I don't know who it is. $495. Sure. I'm transforming small businesses, right? You spend $495 on ads. What are you going to get per month? Nothing. Like $495 gives you... Sure, right? sure. So it is, it's, uh, right, there's two things, right, with sales. One is ROI on what you're spending and what you're getting through. 
B2C businesses, um, where you have click funnels and all this type of stuff, you're very much focused on ROI. Salespeople, we are much more focused on ROT, return on time, time, right? We've only got this much time in the day and we want to bring in a few million dinars worth of business. We want right? to build an empire. So, yeah, so, <laughs> so your sales are very much more focused on, I'm going to spend this much time and I want, want this much, but time is money. But yeah, business to business is much more about the time you spend with people, time you're on process, time you're pulling people through your pipeline. Having to play golf so, with people you don't like. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's there is a there is a character I think you will definitely enjoy if you don't mind me saying so. T uh, Dan, look up um, Tim Dillon, CEO of Fake Business. He used to work in sales, and now n not having to work in sales because he's a comedy guy, he he st he still pretends like he works in sales. Fantastic. So he'll call up like real estate companies, and and just pretend <laughs> like he's a client. <laughs> it's just because as you mentioned for uh, uh, ROT he does not have ROT <laughs> and then he'll, he'll say ridiculous stuff like saying like you know um, I just uh, my client kind of is interested in the property he's just worried if there's any kind of lease restrictions and what kind of businesses can be in there you know is there Starbucks maybe in this like neighborhood and so we couldn't maybe open a coffee shop that kind of stuff and then, you know, he would lead these poor people on for like two, three weeks. Cool. It's really, really cool. And then he'd just say, oh, you know what? The client died, so I don't know where, where we're heading. Yeah, no, I'm the opposite. I think, I mean, comedy is brilliant. Comedy sells, right? Comedy Absolutely. is a, is a really good. If you can put some comedy in your, in your sales process and pitch, it's good. But I'm kind of the opposite. I'm too, as I said, I'm, I'm kind of boring and nice, right? So if people give me a cold call, I really appreciate that. I think good for you. Good okay. for you for making the effort. See, you don't waste people, their time. Yeah, when most people get a cold call, they're like, oh, how dare you call me? You're, and they're either waste their time, they'll keep them on the phone for ages. Um, or they'll just say, don't ever call me again and hang up. I don't. I'm actually like, do you know what? Your pitch is great. Thank you. So I've got no need for your service. I'm, let's not waste any more of your time, right? Um, but really good for you. You know, keep the good work up. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, it's great. People are actually getting out there. And when you get a cold email, I like it. You do? You know, yeah. A lot of people get angry. Oh, why have you sent me an email? Like, no, it's someone's trying to reach out with a service they passionately believe in. Yeah, give them the time of day, you know. Uh, I mean, some of the, the meetings I've gone to, which has been really cold calling, locking on doors, invite you in, give you dates, give you coffee, they look after you. And they're like, no, if you've come to see me, I'm really appreciative of you coming. To see. These are senior people, right? Mm. You've come all the way, you know, across the desert. And you've come you, are ri me. you are a risk factor. You have your address on Google on Google Maps. <laughs> You know that people are just gonna start knocking on your door. <laughs> and be like, hey, you know what? <laughs> You're welcome. Come and see me. Like, You're gonna regret that those words. <laughs> You're gonna regret those. You're gonna call me in three weeks' time and be like, fucking hell, Ahmed, what have you done? Go to hypergrowth.me. Yeah. Uh, if you click on any of the links, there's my mm -hmm. calendly page. Anyone can book time with me. Okay. Anyone. Okay. Right. So, so there you go. Don't show up to his to his address on Google Maps. Be yeah. be kind. If you scroll up to the top again, right? If you click on, you see where it says free sales improvement workshop. Scroll down a little bit. Scroll down a bit more. Yeah, or click on the icon. Yeah, just Whatever. click that. You can now book me. It's open, completely open. My door is open to anyone in the world, particularly Bahrainis and Saudis and people that want to boost their businesses here. Brilliant. Yeah, you can just book me up. Uh, well, you do stand by it, don't you? Four day work week. <laughs> right? You do stand by it, don't you? <laughs> That's because Mondays is back to back with clients. Right. And then Fridays and Saturdays, I do my best to try. I do have a secret link where you can book Fridays and Saturdays, but I won't tell you that one. Wow. <laughs> do you also use a blog or are you not that interested in blogs? Yeah, not really. I mean, right. So. 
as part of psychology and putting yourself out there that people want to buy from you, mm. you do have to position yourself as an expert because people are drawn to experts, right? So if you, if, sure. you, if people perceive you as, right, this person is really good at X, Y, Z, they'll, they'll come towards you. So doing a blog, doing posts to make you, you know, writing a book, whatever it is you want to do, having content. So people think, actually, that person is that if I want a uniform, I'm going to go to Hamad, right? That's because I've seen you doing presentations about uniforms and stuff. It's good to do that. As a sales channel in B2B, blogging, posting content just doesn't work. It's a waste of time, right? It's people, they won't look at an Instagram post on uniforms and go, oh, I'm going to go and use this. It just, it just doesn't work. B2C, great, right? B2C, you have to do a big content thing. The only reason I do occasional posts, and you can see if you go to um, my business, I haven't posted for ages, but the only reason I do that is because what does work in B2B is engagement, right? So, for example, right, mm -hmm. if you're in a particular industry, say, I don't know, selling cigars, cigars whatever. Cigars is a great one, right? Um, if you can find an influencer or the world's best person who talks about cigars who's already got two million followers have a look at what they're posting every day or once a week or however you know stick it in calendarize it is i always love calendarizing stuff right just every week for an hour look at what the top five people in your industry who each have millions of followers are posting look at their last five posts and comment on them right so if if there's the best person who's talking about cigars has said you know Ah, oh, there's this new cigar that's come out and you know there's a better cigar or or the way to smoke that cigar maybe there's a different knife you have to cut it off with or whatever it is right post underneath it yep you're absolutely right this is you know one of the best cigars that you can buy thanks for the advice um, yeah if you want to enjoy it even more you know make sure you, you moisten it first whatever it is right do, do you xyz to use this product even better the amount of responses you because there's a million people following this person and then you've just commented underneath it with some extra really helpful advice. You get loads of people. Oh. So it, when I've done that before, mm. if people comment about sales, uh, you know, post, they, they do the posts on sales. I then comment underneath it saying that's absolutely right. That's absolutely the way you should do pitch. What I also do is try indifference as well or whatever it is that, that you want to put in your pitch. I've got loads of business through that because people are just clock it, right? So email. You know, people write, oh, email marketing still quite good in the Middle East. I write underneath, you're absolutely right. It's very underused. Uh, I send out 7,000 emails per week for all of my clients. The number of people I've come back, oh, can you do that for me? <laughs> so engagement for business to business, posting doesn't really work. But with your, uh, like, with your client base, because I saw now on both your websites and on your LinkedIn, I think the, the key factor that I think you're, you're not hitting, if you don't mind me saying, is, is not getting enough customer feedback. I think that's the key ingredient that you're really missing is, yeah. is just after you've helped that client, whatever, and being like, hey, you know what? Do you mind if we take a two minute video, one minute video, explain the process, how do you find it? How did it grow? How did it help? Blah, blah, blah. And then post that content out, right? Because that immediately then verifies your business and establishment. I've got one. I mean, on the website, if you look at clients, there, there's one on there, but People confuse testimonials with case studies. Sure. Testimonials, oh, I can't be bothered with. They're like, they help, but so what, right? Testimonial, again, B2C, you're very, very B2C folks, right? B2C, oh, you know, Sharon uses this product. I want to use this product too, right? It's a very, testimonials are very B2C. B2B is much more around case studies, right? So a case study is structured very, very differently, right? So a case study is, and typically they they can be verbal, right? So um, let, let me give you a case study, right? So, okay, there's, there's a, a guy in Australia called Anastasis, okay? He runs a consulting and training business and he's run it for 10 years, right? And for the last 10 years, some years he's made a bit of a profit, some years he's made a bit of a loss, but after 10 years, really not much to show for it. So he was actually thinking he was going to shut down his business. He's had enough, going to shut it down. And I said, Anastasis, don't, you know, I can help you with sales. I can really help you drive your business forward. And his main problem was lead generation. He's just not getting enough leads, right? So he's sitting there, great product, great service, 
no one to sell it to. So I worked with him for six months. Um, I asked him at the end of six months exactly what I've managed to do for him, right? So he said, Miles, the big thing you did for me was I've now got 10 times the leads I've ever had in my life, right? By implementing my system, I've now got 10 times the leads and 10 times the business. But he said, in addition to that, the best thing is by running this hyper growth program and looking at this system, I'm now spending half the time generating these leads. So I'm generating 10 times the number of leads for half the time because I've systemized it all and got it going. Now that's a case study and everyone who, if you're in business to business and you know, you can relate a case study to someone with who they are, what their problem was, what action did you do and what the result was, that's gold dust. So business to business is much more case study focused, whereas testimonials, you did that for someone else, so what? So it's, it's a, it, they're very different. People confuse case studies and testimonials. No, right? no. I, so I, for me, testimonials aren't of any use at all. Really. And, 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 and for case studies, how would you present that? Would you present that as a presentation or would you present just that? Just as I've done now. Just verbal. as a verbal yeah. voice message. So if someone says to me, you know, if I ask someone, so it's, you know, what, what, what is your, you know, what's the biggest thing you're struggling with in sales, right? They might say, well, it's conversion. Right, so I'm getting the leads, but you know, only one in 10 of them are turning into clients. You bash straight into a case study. Well, it's, Hamad, it's interesting you say that. Well, this client I worked with, <laughs> right? They, they had exactly the same problem. They were generating 300 leads every week and only converting four of them into clients, right? So they went through my hyper growth program. They, we, gave a completely new sales process. We analyzed exactly what their qualification criteria was. They went through the program. In six months, they were now closing 50% of their deals. I love your sales right. tactic. Do you, uh, no, I haven't sold anything. I've just said what I've done. So the indifference, it's up to you if you want. Do you want that result? I love, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So yeah, B, B, I love B, it. B, B to C and B to B are so fundamentally different, and most people who are in B to B sales use B to C lead Mechanisms. gen, B to C systems, and they fail because they don't understand the difference between them. I love it. I love it. And and how do you how do you find in most cases decision makers? Not just by title. You have to show up, and then you have to look at the room, and then figure out you know who's everyone listening to. Yeah, you see when yeah you're talking now more consultative sales, right? When you're doing exactly. bigger, ten million dollar type sales, and okay, so th this is, yeah, the the type of stuff I do in hypergrowth is I focused much more on the the SME market, mm. small sales between a few thousand dinars up to fifty thousand dinars. That's that's kind of what I do, right? But I have done much bigger consultative sales in in my career, right? So yeah, this is consultative sales is now one different then you've got key account management which is also another different skill right so there's you know you have to identify which you, you have target to know exactly. where you are and then use the right systems and processes consultative sales is much much longer much deeper you're mapping out relationships um you know exactly who the decision makers who's the plant you know because you within each sale you're going to have one person who will just give you a whole load of information I don't know why, but there's always one person who's really friendly and I'll tell you where everything maps out. You're going to have people who are against the sale. Um, who You know, you have to purposely sideline them or overturn them. Mm. Um, you'll have champions. You'll have the decision makers. You'll have influencers. You have to map everyone out. And a good consultative salesperson will walk into a room of eight or ten people and within a few seconds go there, then, <laughs> right? And you, that's just something you have to learn. That's a skill, absolutely, yeah, right? absolutely. Because yeah, the decision maker often isn't the most senior person because the most senior person will be like, actually, I want, so you, you just have to be- really Completely clear. agree with you. I completely agree with you. It's usually the person who's the quietest in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Nine out of ten times, it's always usually that person and the person who, who the whole everyone looks at. Right, that is usually the the, the power structure, yeah. and if you can convince that quiet person and get him into involvement, then you're more likely to close whatever avenue you're trying to close. And it is that the psychology of consultative sales is is fascinating. It's quiet people. Often you find in group settings, it's someone who's coming out with the most objections. 
they're actually the keenest to buy. It's really weird. It's uh, yeah, it's a t- <laughs> because, because they they, they want to show to the rest of the group that you know what I'm making my job. I'm doing serious work. You know, <laughs> it, it's 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 amazing. It's amazing because. I, I, how do you, especially with like medium to smaller companies, how do you then sidestep the issue of reaching the decision maker? Because even if you're selling at a smaller business, you, the person you're likely talking to, especially when they reach out to you, isn't usually the decision maker, it's usually the secretary, it's usually whatever, whatever, whatever. Because the way I fixed my issue was through the podcast. That's how I handle that situation. I've never really found that, but I, I only speak to the decision maker. I mean, it's, why would you speak to anyone else? Um, if it's an inbound inquiry, um, because that's how so, a lot of our business also works, inbound okay, inquiries. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, I mean, I teach people a five step sales process and step mm. one is, is your, is your phone call. And in the phone call, um, you have to nail three things, right? You have to get them really excited about wanting to speak to you more, not necessarily excited about your product, sure. really excited about wanting to speak to you again in the sales meeting. You have to book a sales meeting. So you actually have to book it in the calendar. And the third thing is you have to qualify this opportunity because if you don't qualify it, don't book a sales meeting, right? And the qualification criteria, they're very, very simple, right? Is it the decision maker? Do they have budget? Do they have need? And is there some form of urgency? Is there a date they, they need this by, right? So if any one of those four things isn't there, don't have the sales meeting. Thank right? you. So totally agree. It, and it's, if you over disqualify people, all you've done is you spent 10 minutes on the phone, bang, you can crack on with the next lead, right? If you, uh, if you mess up that qualification, you're now gonna spend two weeks, two months of your life speaking to someone who's never gonna buy from you, right? The, the impact of not qualifying people in that very first phone call is massive. And people, because they want to sell and they're so keen to sell, they like bringing people into the sales process. Don't over disqualify. <laughs> if you if you say so, oh, I don't think Thank you're you. quite the right person. I can't deal with this because maybe your budget's not quite set yet. Um, I tell you what, why don't you call me back in six months, right? If they are keen, they'll go no 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 no, and they'll try and. And if they're not, right. they know they're, they're wasting they're, their time. They're, you're kick, they're, absolutely they're, they're kicking the tire. So if you're generating enough leads and you've got a good reputation, everything else is right. Over disqualify. Right, because it's it's much better ROT, much better ROT, much better use of your time. But yeah, if they're not the decision maker, why have a sales meeting? Absolutely. Like, right? a, I mean, uh, right of the four things, right? If they've not got budget, mm. they're not going to have budget. You can't change that. Um, if there's no urgency, so if there's no, then just say come back in in six months, right? If there's no need. Then why are you even having this? The only one you can fix is decision maker, right? So if someone rings you up and they're not the decision maker, be really firm about it, but be nice, you know? So, you know, so, you know, I don't know, whatever service it is. Uh, So the last marketing project, you know, are are you the person that ran the project? And they go, no, 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 it's actually my boss that that runs all the marketing projects. And then you say, okay, to save time, uh, why don't you get your marketing boss and the three of us will have a meeting next week on Tuesday. How about that? Mm, mm, right, just mm. bring them in. Just bring the decision maker in. You could be not. And if they say, no, 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 I just want to say, well, I'll tell you what, go and have a look. If they're not interested in bringing the decision maker in, go and have a look at the website. Crack on with the next lead. You know, just don't. I totally agree with you. I totally, totally agree with you. I, especially on, on bringing, it, bringing your manager in while that person also is part of that meeting. Because then they're not feeling like they're they're being like cut out, you know. If you just It'd be nice, exactly. Yeah. If you say like, oh, you know what, just get your boss to call me. That that is nine out of ten times. That's that phone call ain't gonna happen. <clears throat> or tell me who your boss is. I'll call them. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, bring them all in together. Exactly. I totally agree. I, I think the, one of the key issues I think that that sadly is a little different in in, in my industry is that. It is it is very weird still. You know, I've had meetings where where somebody said to me, uh, uh, "You you can't meet the you you can't meet the decision maker because I'm the decision maker." And I was like, "What are you talking about? You're the you're you're not the decision maker." And he was like, "You don't understand. I need my cut." You know, <laughs> right? Or I had I had one guy who who said to me, um, uh, 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 it, "I'm not going to give you the contract because because no no amount of no no amount of 
I'm not going to give you a contract because even if you would give me money, it would be no amount more than me giving my contract to the cousin. Right? And you're like, <laughs> or, or the worst ones, by the way, there's a lot of people, by the way, who will call you to get, to get an estimate of, a, of, of like, like larger order, 500 units, 1,000 units, or blah, 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 just to put on the books that they made the three phone calls, that they got three bids in. Right, and you can you can be easily the cheapest. You can easily be the best. You can be the most expensive. You can be whatever you want on that list, but they're already gonna go with cousin. So there is a lot of like 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 a lot of things that really need still to be cleaned. I think in Saudi Arabia is much much better now. I I, I think you're right. I think it's like ten years ago. Um, it was much more prevalent today. I mean, if you think of all the changes that have gone on. Yeah, you're right, particularly in Saudi. I mean, you know, they've, they've cracked down on it big time, right? It's, it's kind of not worth doing that anymore. It's like, it's, I mean, my business, sure. like 100%, I never do any of it. If, you, if you're not going to, if you don't, it's the indifference. If you don't want the best, then you can go. And yeah, exactly, go. exactly, yeah, exactly. Right. I'm totally but with you. Different countries are different. Um, I mean, one company five, six years ago were effectively frozen out of Q8 just couldn't get any business in Kuwait at all for that business. For, for mm. that reason, in that particular industry, it was very... It was Stonewalled. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it that way, right? Let's put it kindly. Yeah, but and as I say, I just think it's changing so rapidly now. I this, totally and it's agree. literally post-COVID. People are just behaving very different. They're much more... If you can deliver a service which is better and cheaper... Why would you go to your friend anymore? I'll go for the better service, right? Because you want to run a business. You gotta, you know, we're all going through a time when you've but got to be saving money. You've got to be running business as profit. Absolutely, it's, absolutely. But you're not talking to the owner of the hospital, right? You're talking to the general purchaser, whoever is the, the, that like department, right? And right, and you know, they they got to make sure that the cat's got the milk. Let's put it that way. No, I think I think you're right though. Saudi's cleaned up a lot. Aramco is much better. And, you know, I, yeah, yeah, but I mean, the, the, you know, the gifts and stuff like that has always been part of larger enterprises and businesses, right? You can't. With Aramco and Sabic, of course. If you offer them something for one dinar, they'll refuse. Of course, right? of course. They'll just say no. No, no, because that's all been cleaned up now. It's, it's, it's you know, you, the old story was always, you know, a nice watch for Christmas gift or, you know, it was always, you know, uh, let's go for a golf course. Then, oh, by the way, how about a two day vacation somewhere? Oh, it's the famous, let's have a meeting on Thursday afternoon in Bahrain. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's, that's all kind of disappeared. But you know what, what is re remaining? And I think what, what seems to be still prevalent in a good way and I think a lot of enterprises and businesses don't do this enough, and that's to do gatherings in the sense of, you know, rent out a restaurant. It doesn't have to be the most expensive, even if it's just like small food or blah, blah, blah. Invite your competitors, invite your customers, whoever you like. And, and, and I wouldn't invite them the same date, obviously. I would invite them at two separate events, <laughs> ideally. And that way you can, you can get to know your competitors. You can build a good relationship with them. It doesn't have to be always a, fo a force of competition. And you can also invite separately, obviously, at a different date. Competitors. So, so the way I do it with, sure. with my sales meeting service with the three channels, email, um, LinkedIn, but then your webinars. The webinars you can do physically as well, right? So, and, and if you can, they're much, much better to do physically. So... The last one I did here, um, the Bahrain Fintech Bay, right? I got 35 people turning up, all potential clients, all interested in learning about sales, and gave them a two hour workshop on sales. I taught them as much as I could in two hours. True. Now, at the end of that two hours, nine of them wanted to book a sales meeting with me. Nine of them had, they wanted work done on their sales process and stuff. So, the, these are absolutely gold us. If you can have a physical lunch and learn, breakfast session or an evening session. So I've run evening sessions in the British club and things like this. I mean, you know, you spend a little bit of money on dinner so everyone comes in and has a free bite to eat. 
But yeah, the conversion of those events are just massive. Especially right? with, with, if you have a meeting with cli- like past clients, future clients, potential clients. They talk to each other. Oh yeah, Miles is great. He doubled my business, you know, come and, yeah, it's just brilliant. No, the, so yeah, every, what, with my sales meeting service, it's, it's all the outbound channels are driving people to come to these. I call them either workshops or webinars, workshops, right? They want to come and learn something and get something really beneficial. Um, and I, all my clients, I mandate they do this. And it's, yeah, they don't do it. And you can do it on Zoom. You can have a one hour Zoom workshop. If you can do it physically, that's much better. Do you do, you do, do, you do the same thing as Tusk Ventures? What do they do? I don't know what Tusk Ventures do. He, he, well, well it's, it's not the, I mean, they're, they're consultancy for, for, for politicians, getting rules passed, blah, blah, blah. But what, what, the, they're in, what they do is, is send a 7 a.m. Uh, uh, update every client gets like a personalized 7 a.m. update considering like what techniques they should be using for that for okay. for and it gives them like almost like a daily update of what should they be like like actively hitting on or new techniques or new things and stuff like that and uh, uh, Tusk the guy who 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 started it says his conversion and ret- retention is unbelievable because clients really feel like Oh, you know, he's clearly working hard. If I'm getting this email at 7 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> it just gives them like an update. Yeah, no, I don't do that. I don't. Do you, should, you should definitely. You don't have to send it at 7. You can, you know, write in the evening and then just set a timer so it sends off at 7 a.m. Yeah, mate. I'm, you know, I'm kind of doing it. I, yeah, whether that would work as retention or upsell, I'm not sure. As I say, there's, mm. there, there's at least 20 different B2B channels. Mm. Every company has to decide. They have to pick five or six and do those five or six, right? Mm. And maybe that will work for for some companies. One of the big ones that isn't here in Bahrain that somebody should do is networking. Because What are we doing right now? Well, (laughs) you know BNI and you know these networking companies, right? Toastmasters as well, Jesus. Toastmasters is here in Bahrain, that's true. But yeah, Bahrain really lacks a really good networking structure you know a few different people have tried to set them up they've never quite worked or just haven't been sustainable people haven't quite got the model right i I think the problem is not just that i think the problem is also that that the retention is an issue because a lot of people come to bahrain or seasonal right i mean not a lot of people like you like you for example who's who's been here for, for 11 years in and out a lot of people are you know six months a year maybe three and then they're out again and so that conversion process is very difficult. There was even the, there was even that club. Remember um, that they closed down. It was called Capital Club. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and like the, all the financial minister, the ministers were always going there, but that also disappeared. They just couldn't make it profitable. Yeah, that was expensive. <laughs> but I mean, it is it is a golden ticket, right? It gives you access to to to. Very select few crowds. I have a very select crowd. No, <laughs> you're not. You're not. You're not sold. No, I, th- I think the type of networking structure that that Bahrain needs is different. So I think that's it, look to get to see those people. Bahrain is very open. It's one of the things I love about Bahrain. If, Bahrain, if you want to see someone really senior, if you want to see the CEO of you know Babco or GPIC or whatever, and you really have a good reason to see them. They'll meet you, right? You can More meet. likely than not, yeah. Bahrain is lovely like that. The, the, the hierarchy, and if you've got, an, if you can really help someone, they'll meet you, right? Um, what's I think what's needed for small companies here is more of a, you know, management level networking group. So, you know, the owners of small companies and business development people in, you know hotels or logistics and things like this can all get together and network that mm. that kind of doesn't exist